Let's look now at the effects of the disease process. If you look at this patient, you can see a lesion in, in the chin area. And if you look at uh, this patient, you also see a lesion in the chin area, almost in the same spot. Now, the reality is, is that one of these patients has endodontic disease, and one of these patients has periodontal disease, both presenting uh, clinically in, in much the same manner. And you need to be able to distinguish between the two uh, to assess what would the proper treatment be. Let's look at this case. This is a tooth that has severe periodontal disease. It's an integral part of a uh, removable partial denture. Is the tooth treatable or not? Now, many of these images were done before we had implants as an option. Nonetheless, we're still in the business of trying to save teeth as opposed to just taking them out and replacing them because it's, in a, it's an expedient way to go. Here's another situation where you have a pretty severe breakdown in the periradicular area around this tooth. It appears that there's almost no bone around the uh, buccal roots and just some around the palatal roots. And as you're looking at this, you're, you're trying to assess just is this endo or perio? Well, if you're considering endodontic disease, you need to ask what is the etiology? As we're looking at this case, you see that there's two very small um, uh, amalgams, uh, probably just in, this, in the, the mesial pit and the distal pit of, of the molar. So, and there's no decay in this tooth. So you need to think beyond that and that maybe there's primary uh, periodontal disease associated with this tooth. And later on, we'll be talking about what are different ways of assessing and diagnosing this. Let's look at this tooth. This, again, is a critical tooth. If this tooth is removed or lost, then this patient's going to have to have uh, multiple uh, restorations done to replace it, multiple implants, certainly a very extensive treatment plan. So we need to be able to make intelligent decisions before we get in overly involved in, in a treatment plan. Here's another situation where uh, there's periodontal disease that's being created through iatrogenic reasons. There is a perforation through this tooth. The perforation was not recognized until this radiograph was taken. And probably this would have been avoided if there was field isolation with the rubber dam, with the clamping on the second molar rather than on this molar to give you more uh, visual. When you have a perforation at or near the Cressler bone, it's very, very hard to repair even using um, MTA or biodentin. Uh, in a pretty key paper published by one of our faculty, a former faculty member, a dental school graduate uh, of UB and uh, one of my mentors, uh, Roger Zarnecki, they, they took teeth from several patients and they took block sections of the teeth and all the teeth had different amounts of periodontal disease. And the purpose was to look at the pulps of the teeth and evaluate inflammation in the pulp in the presence of periodontally uh, involved teeth but untreated periodontal disease. Uh, what they did is they did a complete clinical workup. Uh, they had 46 teeth that they looked at. They did the histology and did serial sections looking at uh, the whole tooth. And they predetermined an evaluation criteria of, uh, of what they were going to uh, uh, look at. And the principal finding was that they found no correlation between the appearance of the pulp and the periodontal condition of the tooth. So let's look at this tooth here. Uh, this is a slide from the furcation of that, uh, of that molar. And this is not an artifact. What this is is shrinkage of the periodontal tissue from the furcation of the bone. So here's the cementum, or here's where the cementum would be. Uh, this is the dentin, and the canal is, is uh, more coronal. And when you look at the pulp tissue associated with this furcation, you can see that there's absolutely no inflammation. This is normal pulpal tissue adjacent to severe periodontal disease. So their findings were that only teeth with extensive decay 
or have been treated with restorations showed any degree of pulpal inflammation, and this is independent of the absence, presence, or severity of the associated periodontal disease. So they concluded that periodontal disease does not initiate endodontic disease, but periodontal treatment can initiate periodontal disease. Now this point is actually has some contention among endodontists among, among endodontists and also among periodontists, but I'm a firm believer that you can have an absolutely normal pulp in a field of periodontal disease as long as the tooth hasn't been treated. And if you think back to your uh, clinic, clinically when you see patients, you've seen many, many patients with severe periodontal disease, but they're not reporting any type of chief complaint related to the tooth unless there has been manipulation or restoration, uh, deep scaling on, on that tooth. So how does periodontal therapy affect the pulp? Well, when you remove the cementum and the dentin around the tooth, you can have uh, inflammation. Uh, if you expose dentin to the oral environment, you can have an ingress of uh, bacteria. And sometimes cutting with deep scaling accessory canals can cause some inflammation. I'm not a super big believer of the uh, cutting accessory canals, but it's nonetheless it's something that can happen. Endodontic disease has variable uh, effects on, on the periodontium. When you have a periodontal abscess, it can promote pocket formation, make it easier for a periodontal pocket to form on surfaces that have been instrumented during uh, deep scaling. Dentinal tubules can release caustic materials into the periridicular tissues. Again, there isn't a lot of heavy, heavy evidence to support this. And then sometimes when you have a long-standing sinus tract from endodontic disease, it can almost look like an infra-bony pocket. And if you have endodontic disease, it can cause problems when you're trying to put in uh, tissue grafts or you're trying to put in membranes. Nonetheless, something like this is, is fairly common. You have a tooth, it looks like there's extensive endoperial disease, uh, a breakdown here, and just seven months later you see that there's complete resolution following treatment of the tooth. There's evidence of an accessory canal down here, yet the tooth has been uh, at least restored with a post and a core, but there isn't any crown here, and that, you know that's important to the success of this case.